Experiment 10 in Chem 1211K is titled Isolation and Characterization of Proteins. And in this experiment, we're going to explore one of the most important classes of biological macromolecules, proteins. Proteins are polymers of the amino acids, and the structural diversity of the amino acids really gives rise to an enormous number of applications for proteins within our cells. So in this experiment, we're going to explore the chemistry of proteins, which focuses on the function and structure of proteins at the molecular level. So in addition to learning a little bit about what proteins look like at the molecular level and how to control that by controlling chemical conditions, we're also going to explore how to isolate proteins from cells and other biological material. And this isolation problem for proteins is one of the most interesting purification types of problems that we see in chemistry. So let's begin with a basic introduction to the structures of proteins. As I mentioned, proteins are polymers of the amino acids, and a simple amino acid structure is shown for you here. A quick note about this structure, everywhere where you see two different types of lines come together or an angle, you can imagine a carbon sitting there. And there are some implied hydrogens that aren't listed here, but this is a basic convention for organic structures that you'll see throughout this video that's somewhat important to keep in mind, but not critical to remember. So this is an amino acid. And where does this name come from is a good place to start. All amino acids contain two functional groups. Functional groups are groups of atoms that recur in organic structures. A carboxylic acid, which is this OH, this hydroxyl group, bonded to a carbon, which is doubly bonded to another oxygen, that's a carboxylic acid, as well as an amine, which is simply a nitrogen with three single bonds to either alkyl groups or hydrogens, that's an amine. In the amino acids that we find in natural proteins, there is one carbon between the carboxylic acid and the amine. We often call that the alpha carbon. Proteins are polymers, which means that we find amino acids repeating within their structures. What essentially happens is that the nitrogen of the amine functional group forms a bond to the carbon between the two oxygens in the carboxylic acid. And this happens over and over and over again to give us a chain of amino acids running from a carboxylic acid on one side through a bunch of carbon, nitrogen, carbon repeating units all the way to an amine group on the other side. And something that's worth noticing here is that there are R groups that branch out from the alpha carbon, and these R groups really give proteins their structural diversity and function. Within the chain, we can notice that there's this repeating unit of an NH group bonded to a carbon, which is doubly bonded to oxygen, and that functional group is called an amide. The CO double bond is a carbonyl, and a carbonyl carbon bonded to nitrogen represents an amide. You'll hear amides referred to as peptides. The peptide bond is the carbon-nitrogen bond, and so another name for proteins is polypeptides. We also find these R groups branching off from the blue, what's called the backbone, and the R groups in black are called side chains. And again, the structural diversity of the side chains is really where the amazing array of functions for proteins comes from. So just a few examples are given here of possible side chains. They can contain carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, even elements like sulfur, in a variety of configurations. And they can have a variety of polarities that leads to all kinds of different intermolecular forces. We'll come back to that in a second. When a protein is first synthesized in a cell, we could imagine it as a simple linear chain running from an amine, the so-called N-terminus, on one side, to a carboxylic acid, the C-terminus, on the other side. But the protein doesn't end up this way. Over time, what happens is the protein folds into a compact configuration that looks a lot more fancy than the linear chain that the protein started out as. And this folded conformation of the protein chain is really what gives the protein its function. So pockets that can bind molecules, particular structures, strong structures, these kinds of things come in after folding has occurred. The interesting questions to biochemists, really, are why does protein folding occur, how does it occur, and how can we control protein folding to a large degree? This has a variety of applications, ranging from cooking to medicine. At the most fundamental level, protein folding can be attributed to intermolecular forces between atoms within the backbone, the backbone shown in blue, and the side chains, the R groups. 
These intermolecular forces act like little safety pens that hold different parts of the protein chain together and develop what are called secondary structures, regular repeating units like the helices and the sheets that you see within this folded structure um, that really make proteins rigid in three dimensions. Hydrogen bonds are a very common and critical example of the intermolecular forces that hold proteins in a folded state. And one example is shown for you here. So the carbonyl oxygen, for example, within the backbone can hydrogen bond with one of the NH groups that we also find within the backbone. And this kind of intermolecular force is responsible, for example, for holding helices in place. We also find hydrogen bonds between the side chains. So for example, a hydroxyl group and an amino acid like serine can hydrogen bond with another serine hydroxyl group, creating a link between two side chains. Keeping in mind the importance of intermolecular forces is critical because when we start to think about how to disrupt or influence protein folding, it's really playing with these interactions and destroying these intermolecular forces that serves as the basis for denaturing or unfolding proteins. With that introduction to protein structure out of the way, let's talk briefly about the techniques we'll use in this experiment to isolate proteins. So we'll begin with milk and we'll isolate casein proteins or casein proteins from milk, which is essentially a colloid composed of what are called casein micelles. So of course there's calcium in milk, that's very well known. And the calcium in milk is stabilized by a surrounding sphere of casein molecules. The spherical structure is called a micelle, and these micelles are large enough that they can stay suspended in milk so that milk looks like a homogeneous solution. However, for reasons that will become clear shortly, if we decrease the pH of this solution or increase the concentration of solvated protons by introducing acid, the calcium and casein micelles start to break up. And what ends up happening is that we see solid coming out of the milk solution that looks essentially like a precipitate, and that's basically what it is. At the molecular level, what's happening is that the casein molecules are changing chemically. Their, their chemical structure is changing, and as a result of that, their interactions with one another, the intermolecular forces between casein polypeptide chains become stronger than their interactions with calcium 2 plus ions. And so the casein proteins bunch together and form a solid mass while the calcium 2 plus ions remain in aqueous solution. At this point we now have the protein molecules in a separate phase from the liquid and the calcium 2 plus and so we can simply filter out the solid to leave us with the solid protein mass and in fact the solid protein that comes from milk, this mass of casein proteins, is really the curds in curds and whey. So curds and whey is essentially just milk that has been deliberately curdled, and the curds are the solid portion. The whey is the calcium 2 plus and liquid and other soluble components left behind. I won't describe it in detail, but in the laboratory, we'll do a chemical test involving copper 2 plus to confirm that the curds are indeed made of protein. As a second isolation, we'll start with spirulina cells and we'll isolate from these colored proteins called phycobilly proteins. The phycobilly proteins are really interesting because their entire massive structure, the entire polypeptide chain, is basically serving the purpose of making sure that a small molecule embedded within the structure, that's not really an amino acid but what's called a cofactor, is held in a particular position so that it absorbs light properly. The issue with spirulina is somewhat more interesting and complicated because spirulina cells enclose the proteins we want to get after. These proteins are used for photosynthesis, so the cell harvests the energy from light absorption to promote the synthesis of fuels to help it live. So we need to do something to get the proteins out of the cell, and perhaps the crudest method imaginable for doing this is to simply just beat the heck out of the cells until the cell walls break and the proteins are able to leave and go into solution. And this is essentially what we'll do in the laboratory. So using a mortar and pestle, not exactly using a hammer, although we could, we're going to grind up the cells and then we're going to suspend the solid that results in water. So we'll take up all the soluble components, including the water-soluble proteins, into water and we'll be left with some junk in the bottom of the test tube that is all the insoluble components, the insoluble cell walls and, and other things like that, and then a colored solution of the proteins and anything else from the cell that's soluble in water. 
While we could filter this mixture, because we ground it down, there are a lot of really fine particles in this mixture of solid and liquid. And so we're going to use a technique that's common in biochemistry to separate solids from liquids called centrifugation. The basic idea of centrifugation is very simple, and you'll understand it if you've ever ridden like a carnival ride that spins you around rapidly. If you've ridden a ride like that, you know that as you spin, there's a force that kind of pushes you outward, and the centrifuge relies on this idea. It contains a slot for an angled test tube, actually for multiple angled test tubes, and it spins it very rapidly so that the solids get pushed to the bottom of the test tube and the liquid solutions just stay where they are. So a pellet develops at the bottom of the test tube, and then we don't even need to filter. We can simply pour off the liquid on the top to be left with a solution of the protein and plus other colorless solutes. It is true that anything that's water soluble from the cell is going to go into solution along with the protein. However, because only the protein is colored, we don't really care about what else goes into solution. We've seen a couple of examples already that point to the idea that protein folding is critical. The phycobilly proteins are folded in just the right way to hold a small molecule in its light harvesting conformation. And the casein proteins in milk are folded perfectly to form these micelle structures around calcium ions. There are cases, however, where we want to deliberately unfold a protein. For example, in the isolation of casein, we have to unfold the protein to destroy the micelles and separate out the solid protein from the liquid. Protein unfolding is also known as denaturation, and it amounts to unwinding the protein from its coiled or folded conformation to form something that's linear or, at the very least, a different conformation from the functional one, a different shape from the functional shape. The question of how to control protein folding and how to cause protein unfolding ultimately boils down to the chemical question of how to disrupt intramolecular forces. And there are three general ways that we can think about doing this. The first is simply heat. So heat gives the polypeptide chain access to a much wider array of shapes, a much wider array of conformations than it has at lower temperature conditions. Heat essentially causes the protein chain to jiggle randomly. And this allows it to access all kinds of different shapes. There's a good thermodynamic reason why the folded state of the protein is not as likely as we move to higher temperatures. The free energy of each shape is equal to its enthalpy, which is related to the number of intermolecular forces, minus the temperature times its entropy. And as we heat, we give more importance and we start to cause to dominate these conformations that have high entropy and low enthalpy, these unfolded, low intermolecular forces conformations. So as we increase the temperature, we increase the importance of entropy, and so the high entropy random conformations start to take over for the very well-structured, low entropy, very ordered, folded state. The second general method uses what I call concentration effects. And the basic idea here is to simply swamp out or drown out the intermolecular forces between elements of the polypeptide chain by introducing other molecules, small molecules in solution in water for the most part, that can engage in intermolecular forces with the polypeptide chain. And so we end up breaking apart interactions between elements of the polypeptide chain by replacing them with interactions between small molecules and the polypeptide chain. And this leads to unfolding because all of a sudden, all of these sort of molecules attacking the polypeptide chain, you can imagine, disrupt the intermolecular forces between elements within the polypeptide chain and cause unfolding. Certain types of molecules like urea and other hydrogen bonding types of molecules can cause these unfolding by concentration effects to come into play. It requires a large concentration of the small molecule doing the interacting, which is why I call it concentration effects. The third method, and the one that is perhaps most interesting from a chemical perspective, is through chemical modification. And this is most commonly done using pH. pH is equal to the negative log of the concentration of solvated protons. And by altering the pH, we can cause chemical reactions to occur, specifically acid-base processes, within the polypeptide chain. So let's look at an example of how this works. 
Consider an interaction between a carboxylate on the left with an ammonium group on the right. There are two things going on here. There's a hydrogen bond, which you can see, and there's also an electrostatic interaction between the negatively charged carboxylate and the positively charged ammonium. So this is a relatively strong intermolecular force, and we can imagine that these two parts are different parts of the polypeptide backbone. These would be side chains branching off from the backbone, and again, this is like one of those safety pins that holds two parts of the backbone close to one another. But if we introduce protons into the mix, what's going to happen is we're going to protonate or add a proton to basic groups that can accept such a proton, and the negatively charged carboxylate is looking like a really nice base under these conditions. So we can add a proton to the carboxylate, and now we're left with still the ammonium salt on the right, but now we have a carboxylic acid. And the negative charge has disappeared. So in fact, we've destroyed the interaction between the carboxylate and the ammonium salt to some degree. We no longer have the electrostatic interaction, and the hydrogen bonding is likely to be much weaker or completely non-existent after we add that proton. So simply by altering the concentration of protons, we can encourage this process to occur and destroy these intermolecular forces. Now, every hydrogen-bearing group within a polypeptide chain has a critical pH at which we can think about this process happening, and it's called the pKa. You'll learn more about pKa in 1212, but I just want to briefly mention the idea behind pKa and its relation to pH. So the pH scale runs from low pH, which is a very high concentration of protons, to a very high pH, where the concentration of solvated protons is low. And the pKa is like a dividing line between these charged states of a functional group. At very high pH values, we have very low proton concentration, and that means a surplus of negative charges among solutes within the solution. The exact opposite is true at low pH, where the concentration of solvated protons is high. Those protons will tend to react with solutes in solution, and will end up with more positive functionality. So at low pH, we tend to see more of the HA, of the protonated form, of acids and bases, and much less of the deprotonated form. And you can see that on the right-hand side of this reaction scheme. We've got the protonated ammonium, and we've got the protonated carboxylic acid. As we move to higher pHs, we start to lose that, and we end up with more of the deprotonated form, more of the A-, minus, more negative functionalities as we move to higher pH. And you can see that on the left, where the neutral carboxylic acid has been replaced by the negatively charged carboxylate. To summarize, by altering the pH, we can change the ionization state or the charge state of groups that are interacting with one another within the protein. And this disrupts intermolecular forces because much of intermolecular forces relies on electrostatic interactions, opposite charges attracting one another. When we disrupt those charges, we're messing with the intermolecular forces and we can often cause the protein to unfold.